Hello folks, today we are discussing trademarks. Trademark is the most impactful yet the most failing form of intellectual property. Now you may ask, what does a trademark have to do with intellect? Make no mistake, trademark is a vigorous tool that manipulates with your perceptions and discrimination before even it would reach your intellect. This is how it works. Trademarks establish the company's identity, the relationship between the government, service, and consumer. Operating in the speed of light, trademarks link your mind to three things. The mark itself, the product or service, the source of a product or service. Now, when you see the logo of Williams Sonoma, you instantly know that it is a kitchenware store. The fat duck mark is about a gourmet restaurant. Likewise, you identify the fashion giants Gucci or Givenchy. Marks presented herein, by the way, do not have the same distinction or power in terms of connecting your mind with the source or service. We shall talk about the distinctiveness or vigor of a trademark later. In the United States, trademarks are governed by a federal law known as the Lanham Act, or the Trademark Act of 1946. What you need to know about this law in the first place is that the Lanham Act is only for identifying marks by testing their linkage to the goods or services. It does not protect the mark itself or the trademark owner. It is the trademark owner's responsibility to protect his mark by actively using it or by filing lawsuits against the alleged infringers. Next, the issues presented in the trademark lawsuits are not about the quality of goods or services. Quality is a subjective measure, after all. Rather, the trademark disputes are to determine the strengths and distinctiveness of a mark. In slide number four, you saw trademarks that incorporate both symbols and words. Some have the acronym or initials like KFC for Kentucky Fried Chicken. This raises a question. Do both, trademark and red name, have the same strengths of property or identity? Do they both require registration? Trademarks identify or distinguish goods or services and sources of those goods or services. Whereas, trade name is a word or symbol used to distinguish business, company or partnership, not the source. Basically, the purpose of a trade name is for the state officials to know what companies are operating within the state's borders. This is generally for the taxation purposes. You register your trade name at the state department at the state level. Therefore, its registration does not give you unlimited rights for name, and the level of protection of a trade name varies from state to state. For example, in the states of Colorado and Wisconsin, trade name registration provides with a notice that you are using that particular title for your commerce, but it doesn't prevent anyone else from using the same name. Georgia is among the few states where registering a trade name varies between the counties. And you may need to publish notice of your proposed DBA, which stands for Doing Business As DBA, in a local county's newspaper. Then again, what is the corner bookstore? A trade name or a trademark? You see, because it's more typical to a business name, not the source, we treat it as a trade name. The word bookstore is a generic name, like the words pencil, house, and it can't stand for a trademark, right? Because it's too generic. The only distinctive word here is corner, which does not link, however, our minds to the source of this business, which is about selling books. Therefore, 
we treat the corner bookstore as a trade name, not a trademark. Often, trademarks and trade names overlap, yet they do not have the same level of protection. A trademark offers legal protection for a symbol, logo, slogan, phrase, word, design, or other element that associates products or services with a business. Registering a company's trade name is much simpler than registering a trademark. Although the trade names are registered in the state level, if your company or business joins an interstate commerce, you need to file in each state where you conduct business. Trade name registration is just a matter of paying a non-refundable application fee, which, depending on the state, ranges between $15 to $25 only. Now let's look at the core differences of regulations of trademarks and trade names. Trade name is recommended but not required. Trade name is registered only at the state level. Trademark registration can occur at both state and federal levels and vigorous trademarks may acquire a federal protection. Some states restrict trade name registration based on similarity. For example, if you name your floral shop Mindy's Flowers, spelling Mindy with Y, and someone else filed a registration for Mindy's Flowers where Mindy is spelled with I, the second registration might be invalid. While the spellings are different, similarity causes confusion because these are homophone words and they sound identical. Many states are struggling to prevent such complications to protect the consumers through specific provisions which you will study from this slide later. You have to check the specifics of required trade name distinctiveness in your state or your county if you are in Georgia. Now let's see how the common law defines trade name. Alderman v. Iditarod Properties Incorporated. You will study the case later. In summary, based on the opinion delivered by Justice Carbonetti of Alaska Supreme Court, the difference between the trademark and trade name is that the former is applicable to the vendible commodity and the latter to a business and its goodwill. The court also held that the protection of both marks and names must follow the same standards, as in many cases the trade names and trade marks serve the same basic purpose. If you remember in the former slide, we talked about William Sonoma, a trade name that does not necessarily translate the nature of that business. Whereas, in Kentucky Fried Chicken, the trade name already explains what that particular business is about. What is trade dress? It is the look and feel of a product or service. It's not about the source. Trade dress deals with combination of color, shapes, images, odors, sounds. In the United States, trade dress is not protected by the Lanham Act. It is rather governed by common law in two ways either by acquiring stable looks over time used in the commerce or by registration with the United States Patent and Trademark Office or USPTO. Now, in 2 pesos v. Taco Cabana, the issue was whether the trade dress of a restaurant is protected under the Section 43A of the Lanham Act based on a finding of inherent distinctiveness without proof that the trade dress has secondary meaning. The U.S. Supreme Court held that an inherently distinctive trade dress is protectable under the Section 43 of the Lanham Act, even without showing that it has acquired secondary meaning. Now, what is secondary meaning? In order to answer that question, we first need to appreciate that marks are distinctive in two ways, inherent and acquired. Inherently distinctive marks have the ability upon being used for the very first time to communicate the consumer that the mark is the identifier of the source, not the describer. For example, your state ID or passport is your identity, not your character.
Acquired distinctiveness is when the mark has become distinctive as applied to the applicant's goods or services in commerce. This is the character of trademark and is governed by the Section 1052F of the Lanham Act. A non-distinctive trademark is prima facie unregisterable, period. However, most jurisdictions may allow such marks to be registered if the owner can demonstrate that in the marketplace, consumers exclusively associate the mark as the identifier of goods or services or the source, which is about the acquired distinctiveness. So. If a proposed trademark is not inherently distinctive, it may be listed in principal register only upon proof of acquired distinctiveness or secondary meaning, which means that the mark has become distinctive over time as applied to the goods or services in commerce. Trademark law requires originality, which means that the new symbol, name or word would create the least likelihood of consumer's confusion. Accordingly, a trademark can be registered as long as it has distinctive capacity. As I mentioned before, trade name 2 must have distinctive capacity. The concept of distinctiveness has two components, intrinsic capacity or originality, the mark's ability to identify when considered in itself, and extrinsic capacity or novelty the mark's uniqueness from other existing marks. This is not the same novelty we attribute to patents. A patent's novelty is about being innovative, groundbreaking, novel. The trademark's novelty is about being unique. A mark can be silly but unique. Now, below you see the scaling of marks from unique to common with a degree of their protection. A common law standard we name Abercrombie factors. The scale ranges from the most protected, the most powerful mark, which is fanciful, to the least protected generic mark. The Lanham Act does not protect generic marks. Now the factors. Abercrombie is a common law standard named after the title of the lawsuit, referring to the trademark's color, shape, odor, hint, or fashion. It establishes the spectrum of trademark distinctiveness by breaking trademarks into classes with different degrees of protection, known as Abercrombie factors, as you saw displayed in the former slide. Here I provide with descriptions of each category of mark in terms of its distinctiveness and protection. You will read the details later. The point is that distinctiveness is a dynamic process and therefore the power of a mark can change over time. Inherently distinctive marks have the ability upon being used for the very first time to communicate to consumer that the mark is identifying the source of product as opposed to describing the product itself. Examples of such fanciful or powerful marks I brought before included Exxon, Xerox, Kodak, words that were not known before the related businesses were named and marked by them. Acquired distinctiveness is when the mark becomes distinctive over time as applied to the goods or services in commerce. There are three basic types of evidence used to establish acquired distinctiveness under Section 1052F of the Lanham Act. Prior registration, five years rule, and other evidence, the description of which you can find in the Federal Code 37 as well as in the Common Law Cases or USTPO website. Trade Dress 2 is subject matter for infringement lawsuits. Below are brief highlights of the trade dress lawsuit suggesting that trade dress or product design or even the color alone can be distinctive and if so, it can be protected only upon showing secondary meaning, which we discussed before. If you remember from the former slide, secondary meaning is that the consumer primarily associates the trademark with a particular producer rather than the underlying product Secondary meaning is governed by the Acquired Distinctiveness Clause, Section 1052F of the Lanham Act. 
Can a product packaging be considered as trade dress? Is trade dress distinctive? Can it be treated as a trademark? The answer to all raised questions is yes. Product packaging is treated like another trademark. Product design is subject to a special rule that requires, again, showing acquired distinctiveness. In Yankee v. Bridgewater case, the First Circuit affirmed the proposition that in order for a trade dress be protected under the Lanham Act, Section 43A, plaintiff must prove that the dress is used in commerce, is non-functional, and is distinctive, at least with acquired secondary meaning, whereby the public does view its primary significance as identifying the source of product rather than the product itself. It must not be descriptive or functional. In Yagi Candle case, the court ruled and affirmed by identifying three ways of alleged trade dress infringement. First, by copying Yankee's method of shelving and displaying candles in stores or vertical display system. Next, by copying the overall look and feel of Yankee's house warmer line of candles. And lastly, by copying the design of Yankee's catalog. The court held that the vertical display system was manifestly functional. Thus, Yankee could not invoke the Lanham Act to appropriate such a conventional method of presenting its wares. If you remember, trademarks must not be functional, opposed to patents that must show functionality. Next, both claims for look and feel of candle lines and for the layout of Yankee's catalog alleged trade dress infringement of a product design configuration rather than infringement of a product packaging. Therefore, neither aspect of Yankee's trade dress could be inherently distinctive. The Yankee had fallen short of showing secondary meaning in a product design or configuration. Once we talked about the trademark distinctiveness opposed to the quality of the product as an attribute of a mark's strengths, here I present two famous marks where the trademarks and trade dresses overlap and where the diminished quality actually helps the infringer to avoid litigation. In the upper left corner are the Oscar de la Renda necklaces. Oscar de la Renda is known for its floral or embroidery patterns, both in its jewelry and clothing industries, distinct with a heavy reliance on flower petals and leaves. In the upper right corner is Versace, with its famous Medusa face as independent, with typical lion head surrounded by a pattern of Greek straight geometric shapes that we call meandros or the Greek fret. Below, of course, are the counterfeit, the imitations, so here we are dealing with the quality issue, right? As you see, the infringed samples have intentionally blurred marks of the Medusa, so the fake items with fake marks are clever enough to mislead an uninformed customer and least distinctive to avoid infringement lawsuits. This is one of the determinants that makes trademark law the most failing intellectual property law, because in certain instances, the customer has to be a connoisseur or expert to distinguish the original mark from the counterfeit. Now, these are my personal Versace items, 18 karat gold. I bought them in Europe in 1999, 21 years ago. This one is 36 grams with typical Versace pattern of geometric threads, but there is no Medusa mark on it. The store where I bought it was reliable. I paid only $220 then in 1999. I was told it was Versace, but I think would this one carry Medusa mark, it would be 50 fold more expensive. But I like it. This one I bought in late 1999, again in Europe. It's 10 grams, a typical Versace style of white and yellow gold interplay, matte and glossy, both 18 carats of gold. I paid for this one $90 only 
because then in 1999, one gram gold costed $9 only, and for a 10 gram chain, I paid $90. As the seller did me a favor and dropped the cost for the crafter's labor of making this chain. Now let's look at some pieces of Bohem crystal and antique solid silverware that I own here in the United States. I bought them online. In Europe, I had a larger collection, all gone with wind. I clustered on this curio shelf a small exhibit for this particular presentation. This slide shows the photographed sample of my items. For this presentation, I chose small and compact pieces for convenience. So I can turn them upside down to show you the marks or rather definitive factors. Silver hallmarks belong to a large number of countries, as you know. But today, I focus on three hallmarks only to fit my collection. My selected solid silver items are the works of the Russian, German and British masters. Let's start from the Bohemian crystal. The look and feel of Czech Bohemian crystal is a glass workshop in traditional three colors, emerald, cobalt, pink, plated by the 14, 18 or 24 karat gold, typically matte, not glossy, but with glossy edges, with floral animal relief. In this slide, I explain the chemical content of each color of the glass, the elements or compounds responsible for a particular color of the crystal. Here you will also read the origins of the word Bohemia and history of Moser. The important thing to remember is that Moser crystals of the Imperial Bohemia, as well as Czechoslovakia, the USSR era, are the vintage crystals blown by mouse that leaves the trace of pontil at the base of the piece, a scar showing where the glass blowing tool was attached. In this slide, I wrote some pieces, decanters, vases, baskets, making the contrast of the original Moser and modern imitations by other countries that do not have the same value. The upper row shows the original vintage Moser and the row below shows the cheap product. Remember the following distinctive signs. First is the circular pontel or the pond mark, the scar on the base. See the last image to the right? Next is the signature of Moser, or the hallmark label itself. Third, gold-plated showcase. The original Moser typically has the matte effect and the gold plate does not diminish or decolorize over time. The last sign is the color of the glass and the enameled floral workshop. The vintage comes in three settled colors, pink, emerald green, and cobalt blue. The modern pieces have a broader range of tones, from the opaque white to honey gold. This cranberry color glass below is a cheap product. Now let's talk about silver. The silverware purity mark does not necessarily indicate that the item is of solid silver. It can be alloy or electroplated silver on a base metal, such as brass, copper, nickel, zinc, or even a weighted resin coated with fine silver. In general, the experts use the nitric acid test to differentiate the solid silver from silver plate. However, chemical test is not entirely reliable. One needs to be able to analyze the hallmarks critically in the effort to match many factors together such as the year of production or the years of the maker's registration with the town marks which are strictly governed by frequently adjusted decrees. German hallmarking system was unified in 1888 based on the decree of 1886 adopting the national mark crescent and crown indicative of 800 parts per thousand that system is still in use to the present day although 830 835 900 925 935 purities are also used prior to the decree of 1886 the antique german silver marks were presented in coats of arms of various german towns to show the purity of silver see some below to me, the Frankfurt rooster in head is the funniest, don't you think? The marks would be accompanied by the master's initials like Gottlieb Menzel of Augsburg or Ludwig Friedrich Schmatz of Hernhardt or Matthias Muller of Holstein. 
After 1886, the German silver marks contain the town mark, the purity mark, and the maker's initials. Here are my German pieces, three of them. This one is an 800 mark solid silver, a compote bowl. Let me magnify the mark for you. The town mark is from Hanna, which corresponds to the year of 1850, the 19th century, and the maker's initials are JK for Johann Zygmunt Kurz, who mastered between 1816 to 1960. So the artist's name matches with the town mark. Don't confuse this master with Paul Kurtz of Castlestadt, who worked in London and Sheffield, Great Britain. My pieces are from Johann Zygmunt Kurtz of Hanau. These two are made in 1819 with two marks only, the Purity 835 and the Lion Lampert associated with the town Darmstadt because it is too old, made before the decree of 1886. After slide 32 and 41, I believe, I am going to show you some pieces from my Russian and British collections, but now, for a quick contrast, I want to show you these two creamers. One is German, which also looks like French, don't you think? And the other is typical British, with its cabriolet legs. Look at those. Both are charming in their own ways. Now let's see the German silver-plated marks. CL means silver clad or plated, and the number 10 corresponds to the proportion, 10%. WMF, which you see in the middle, is one of the earliest German marks used through 1880 to 1918 and typically placed in a cartouche. See the intentionally unusual form of the letter F to hint that this is not a solid silver because the letter F is altered. EP means electroplated. NS stands for new silver. The ratio IO shows one gram of silver used per one decimeter square of base metal surface. Now Russian silver marks. Starting from the 11th century, the Kievan Rus in Russian it is Kievskaya Rus, used Zolotnik as a standard for silver. Zolotnik is from the root word Zolote, which in Russian means gold, and it is from the eponymous word corresponding to the Russian coin. Later, in 1700, Peter I, or Peter the Great, issued an ukaz, an order, to fix the silver assay charter on production of four purity standards. One zolotnik zol is a weight unit of silver or gold and is valued at 196 of a pound. 96 zolotniks equal to one Russian pound. Below you see how those convert to the sterling values. The most common Russian silver mark is 84 zol that corresponds to the 0.875 millesimal purity in British standards. The decree of Tsar Peter I also set registration standards for gold and silver marks. Since then, the items had to carry four marks. One for the maker's name, initials or full name. Second for the assayer's name. The third is Zol, purity mark. And the fourth is the town mark. The columns below are independent from each other. This need not to be combined. In the first column, you see famous names such as Shapochnikov, Hlebnikov. The second column present the assayers' names. Some of them are famous too. Remember, the assayers are not the masters. They do not create. These are the examiners. Basically, their job is to secure that the silver or gold bullion means meet the correct purity standards and content that is being claimed. Let's read the full mark below. The master is Matthias Kilpelainen. The assayer is Ivan Yevstigneev. The zol is 84 or 875 purity in British standards. The town where the piece was made is St. Petersburg. Kokoshnik hallmark has a special place in the Russian silver making. Usually, the word kokoshnik has a different meaning and use. It also refers to the Russian folk headdress that the women wear with sarafan. 
Here the third picture to the right is Empress Marie Fyodorovna of Russia in her diamond kokoshnik. She was Nicholas II's mother, remember? She was Dane, born in Copenhagen, Denmark. Eventually, she became the mother-in-law for the Empress Alexandra, who was Queen Victoria's granddaughter from the second daughter, Princess Alice. In 1896, Tsar Nicholas II issued an edict that reformed the older essay marking system. The hallmark of Koshnik was introduced in 1899. Until 1908, the mark consisted of an intaglio engraved left-facing woman's head in profile wearing kokoshnik engraved in the oval cartouche. Why do we discuss these details? Because I'm going to explain how can we use kokoshnik, even its position, to identify fraud. In 1899, the maker's letter was added behind the kokoshnik sign. See the Russian letter R to the right, which in English looks like P. That R is the coding of Alexander Romanov. And the Kokoshnik is in oval cartouche with flattened bottom. Since 1908, Kokoshnik was turned to the right and the Cyrillic letter was replaced by a Greek letter for the essayer's location. And here the Greek letter is Delta for Moscow. Look at the right. Now let's spy counterfeit, shall we? I love doing so. In the marks below, ladies face to the right instead of left, opposed to what was ordered by the Edict of 1896. The first mark bears initials P.O. for Pavel Avchinikov, who worked in Moscow from 1853 to 1916. As far as the right-facing Kokoshnik was permitted since 1908, then this mark is original. Also, there is a tiny essay letter behind. The 87 Zoll mark is odd enough and does not associate to the initials TF, an anonymous master who worked in 1886 when Zoll was already narrowed to four standards, 96, 90, 84, 62, and 87 wasn't one of them. The last two marks are originals because they do have essay letters. This slide simply shows a few pieces of enameled and gold-plated silver work from Gupkin, Hlebnikov, Kovatsky, Avchinikov, Savinkov. And let's make it clear, I do not own these particular four works. Those are only for display. These are very expensive pieces, each may range from $2,500 to $25,000. Peter Carl Fabergé. Who doesn't know this name, right? Fabergé was a genius of mixed ethnicity, born to a German father and a Dane mother. He is best known for the mastering or supervising the making of 52 imperial Easter eggs, of which only 46 have survived. He also smithed gold-plated and gulosh enameled 84 Zoll silver from 1882 to 1918. In the first row, you see the original of Fabergé hallmarks with three known extensions of his name, either forename, initial and full surname, or the surname alone, or the initials of both. Now let's look the marks below. Are these fake? It's hard to say because the Kokoshniks 88, 84 and 56 souls face right, but they do include the Greek Delta, the code for Moscow. Yet Fabergé worked in St. Petersburg, so the Greek code should be Alpha for St. Petersburg. Also, Fabergé liked to be marked with the imperial double-headed eagle. This one, Zolt 56, is the correct mark for 14 karat gold and the item seems to be of gold, so it's original. Justly indeed, the Russians take enormous pride for their legendary artist. Below are displayed three originals of Fabergé X. First is the rose trellis egg, jeweled by Henrik Wingstrom in 1907, under the supervision of Fabergé. When we say Fabergé X, it doesn't necessarily mean that all 52 eggs were crafted by Fabergé himself, 
There are eggs like this particular one, jeweled by younger masters under his supervision. This egg was intended as an Easter gift for Empress Alexandra Feodorovna, Nicholas II's wife, who was Queen Victoria's and Prince Albert's granddaughter. The egg is shaped by gold, green and pink enamel, rose-cut diamonds and satin lining. Today, it rests in Walder's Art Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. Next is everyone's favorite Lilies of the Valley egg, made by Michael Perchin under Fabergé's supervision. It was made in 1898 in Art Nouveau style as a gift for Empress Alexandra Fyodorovna. The egg is covered in pearls and topped with pink gloss of animal, supported by cabriolet legs. It is adorned by green gold leaves with rose-cut diamond dewdrops. Currently, it belongs to the Fabergé Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. The third one, Zarevich egg, was crafted in 1912 from gold lapis lazuli and diamonds by a master supervised by Fabergé. It was a gift for Prince Alexei Romanov, the only son of Tsar Nicholas. It is hosted by Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond, Virginia. Well, well, the last two in the right are fake, and it is obvious from their bright colors and gross looks. Now, the imitations of Fabergé eggs currently flooding the online market are not necessarily counterfeit, as they do not carry falsified marks and also they are cheap, in the region of $35 to $200 each, while the originals are priceless, and those that are deployed from the museums to free market cost between $15,000 to $33 million each. So, the act of imitating Fabergé eggs does not constitute a crime of fraud. However, it is infringement, and I will explain why. Many of you may have bought small models or souvenirs of Statue of Liberty or Eiffel Tower or Brussels Atomium, and by doing so, you knew well that these were just souvenirs. Thus, a customer's instant judgment about an item being just a souvenir rules out the counterfeit or trademark dilution issue, no matter how poor the quality of the souvenir is. However, imitations of Fabergé eggs have the exact same size as the original eggs, and that dilutes the mark because the owner of an imitated cheap piece may brag about it in public, mispresent as owning the real imperial egg, and leave the spectator disappointed by the low quality of the egg. In the case of small souvenirs, like Statue of Liberty, the buyer knows that it is just a souvenir, as the real statue is 93 meters long. Would Fabergé eggs be imitated in tiny sizes, like in form of pendants or earrings, that would rule out hallmark infringement or dilution issue. The word Kubachi originates from the Kubachins, a small ethnic group of Dagestan, a federal subject of Russia, neighboring the country of Georgia. Their nickname is the Mountain Jews. This ethnic group is famous for their unique silver art with distinctive black enamel workshop on silver belts, bracelets, head colors, swords, tableware. Displayed below are my own personal items of Kubachin 84 Zolt solid silver. Here is my Kubachi bracelet. I displayed it in the former slide. Let me magnify the mark for you. And this is my cozy Kubachi teacup holder, Pat Stakanik in Russian. I have four of those different designs. All Russian pieces I own are 875 purity per thousand. As for the belt, I do not have it now. I sold it in 2013 here in Atlanta when I was in hardship and I painfully regret for it. It was over 700 grams of 84 Zoll Kubachi silver with typical black smoked enamel relief on each segment. The picture you see here was taken in November 2012 here, I show chic kubachi pieces manufactured after 1958. Some are gold-plated, some are not. 
Regardless, the black workshop is the pleasant must. In the right upper corner is a fake mark. As you see, the initials of the maker are Russian HE for Ivan Chlebnikov. A sayer is AA, Anatoly Artsibashev. The town mark is for Moscow. The Zol is 84. And all are accompanied with the Soviet star. Really? Remember that Artsibashev and Chlebnikov worked in pre revolutionary Russia, not in the Soviet era. Finally, we reach the British hallmarks. From the 12th century, the craft of silversmiths in Britain was regulated in conformity with the royal ordinances and acts of the parliament. A complete British mark has five components. First is the maker's name or initials. Next, a seer's date letter. Third is the town mark or mark of origin. Next, duty mark. Fifth is the standard mark instead of the millesimal purity digits. Some marks also have the sixth component, for instance, the jubilee or special marks such as journeyman mark, workman mark, etc. Now let's look at the basic distinctive features of the solid silver and silver plate mark from British masters. Just like in German marks, the Britons too mark both solid silver and silver plate or electroplate. Often you can see the word sterling engraved on a plated resin or base metal, like brass, zinc, copper, nickel. The candelabra below is of silver plated ceramic. Would it be silver, it probably would cost up to $30,000. But because it is silver plated ceramic, it costs maximum $100. That's quite confusing, right? The Russians don't mark silver plate. They stamp letter M for the Melchior or alloy together with the five padded Soviet star with hammer and sickle. Below you see two marks that are similar because they both have a crown mark. Yet the first is silver plate. The maker is E.M. Evans and Matthews of Birmingham. The second is solid silver by Martin Bros and Company. The essayer is Sheffield. Both have the crown. The difference is that the lion passant, the standard mark, is missing in silver plate. By the way, the crown was banned on silver plated items in 1890. However, the Sheffield office only continued stamping it on silver plated items until 1895. We will talk about that later. Now let's go on reading all elements of British silver hallmark. The first is the master's or maker's mark used in Britain since the 15th century and only for a short period of time, up to 1719. The mark was formed with the first two letters of maker's surname. For example, if the master's surname was Jacobson, the mark would carry J-A, the first two letters of Jacobson, which could be confusing because it also could be Jackman. Therefore, later, the master's marks were changed to present the initials of forename and surname. Various letters, from tacky to fancy, were utilized to make distinctions between the masters who had the same initials. The date letter first appeared on English silver and silver plate in 1697 after the mandate of William III, which required to denote the year in which the item was crafted by marking corresponding English letters in circles, as shown below. After 1697, the small and capital letters, as you see in the row below, were used to link the essayer's name and year of production and testing. I will show the website where you can read the catalogs by the help of those letters. The main essay offices were Birmingham, Chester, Dublin, Edinburgh, Exeter, Glasgow, London, Sheffield and York. The legislation of marking letters remained effective until 1999 when the British Parliament adopted European hallmarking practice which does not require an SAR mark on the silver. In the modern British silverware, the town mark is missing. The town mark or mark of origin identifies the SA office location. For example, London's mark is the Leo's hat, crowned or uncrowned, before, the leopard's head was the uniform nationwide mark. 
Birmingham's mark is an anchor, and in certain years it had different rotation angles, which I will explain later. Chester's is three with sheaths and sword. Sheffield's is crown and Tudor's rose. York's a cross. Exeter's a castle with three towers, the new castle upon time. Edinburgh's a castle, Glasgow's three fish and bell, you can see that well. And Dublin's, which is not in Britain but has a solid share in British silverware, is the crowned harp and Hibernia. The fourth mark is the one that in Russia or Germany is named the purity mark or part per thousand. The Britons have a different name for it, standard mark. Since the 14th century, the 28th statute set the British silver standard in a troy pound, which is 0.925. In a short period from 1696 to 1719, the standard was elevated to 958.4 with Britannia mark as the proof. In 1719, the Parliament established Lion Passant as standard for 92.5% sterling and Britannia is no longer in use. Today the SA office certifies 0.925 by Lion Passant mark. When you see the Britannia for standard mark, do not confuse it with Hibernia, Dublin's SA mark. Remember, after 1999, the SA marks are no longer on British silver. If you see the rare Britannia, it must be a very old piece. Next is the duty mark. From 1784 to 1890, a sovereign's head was marked to show payment of duty or tax on a silver piece. For only nine months in 1797, the king's head was duplicated to show owing a double duty. A duty drawback mark was used in the late 18th century to claim taxes on the exported items. A special duty mark, Hibernia, was used in Dublin from 1730 to 1806. Here I have red circled the duty marks used in both silver and silver plate. The ones to the left are from solid silver. Now look at the piece to the right. It is electroplate. As you see, the lion passant is missing. Instead, you see Hibernia mark. Further, the date letter, capital E, which fits to the period of 1751 to 1801. Do you see the crown mark here on this electroplated piece? This one had to be banned later in 1890. Please appreciate that the Hibernian mark on the silver plated item to the right is not the Dublin stone mark, rather it's a duty mark. The maker basically claimed that he was going to pay duty to both Ireland and Britain from the sale of this item. It's very odd mark though, and obviously it would go for overrated price. Judy Dodger is the nickname of silversmiths who used fraudulent methods to avoid paying taxes. They inserted tiny discs that bore marks associated with lower taxes onto their silver or silver-plated pieces. Next is the special mark, a non-mandatory element in British hallmarking system. To the left see traditionally five marked bucket where the special mark is missing. To the right, see a six marked piece. Let's read it from left to right. The first is the special mark named Journeyman Mark, which I cropped in the red square, which in this example is Tetrascalion. Other special marks could be a hand, shoe, depending on the occasion. Who was the journeyman? The word journeyman originates from the French journey, which is about a period of one day. The case behind this mark is that a journeyman had to obtain a reward for each working day under the master's supervision. Typically, those were men who didn't have citizenship or freedom, but they were permitted livery and were qualified to ply their skills and trade as journeymen. The second mark is maker's mark. Here the master is William Chonder. Then comes the standard mark with lion passant, then town mark, in this case it's Leo's head for London, then date letter, then duty mark, the head of sovereign, in this case George IV. 
Now, this is a helpful website, an invaluable resource provided for free, where you can research about the origins, date letters, and making of British silver. In the web link, you see an extension for dates, or you can instead choose the extension for makers, depending what you want to find out. If you are on the date marks side, you have choices of time marks. If your item has an anchor mark, for example, it corresponds to Birmingham. Click on the city of Birmingham and be navigated to the date letter page. The coding is by capital and small letters because this way the selection is doubled. If the date letter of your item is J, click on it and move to this page which is denser and which has my two red ellipses. The 19th century marks have the sovereign's head mark. If you look at the 2008 production, you see the anchor sign rotated 90 degrees to the left. This teaches you that the modern items, if marked Birmingham, must have the rotated anchor. And if you see the anchor in a modern piece rotated to the right instead of left, that must be fraud. There is no question. A quick exercise. The seller of this loop is from Eastern Europe. And I know it because I often purchase silver items online. If you remember from the former slides, from 1860 to 1899, the anchor mark for Birmingham was rotated 90 degrees to the right. After and until 1999, it was vertically positioned. Since 2000, the anchor is turned 90 degrees to the left based on the anchor's position and purity digits. This is a modern work. Yet there is also the York mark, the cross. Can it be one loop to assayers? The double line percent could be the answer. These are my personal British solid silver items specifically selected for this presentation. Most of them I have purchased online. Let's start from this creamer. Gold plated inside with this elegant cabriolet legs that give it such a proud stance. Don't you think? Let me magnify for you the marks. You see the lion percent that stands for sterling silver. Next is the town mark for London, Leo's face. You also see the maker's initials and the letter R, small letter R. And if you look for it in the website I just shared, you will find out that this item was made in 1912. The masters are Alan Darwin, whose years of registration match to the date letter R. Now, when you look at the London's mark page, you see all matching details. Yet, the central question still needs to be addressed. Is this creamer made in 1912 or in 1574, 16th century? The year of 1574 has the same three marks, London's Leo mark, the lamp is sand for purity, and the small letter R. Yet, the letter R associated to the 16th century is fancier, contrasted to the tacky letter R associated to the year of 1912. Thus, my creamer was made in 1912. Next is my most favorite, this adorable master thought from Chester, England, made in 1909. I am magnifying for you the marks. The maker's initials are JW for John Woodman. The line percent indicates its sterling purity. The town mark is for Chester. The date letter is capital J. Now let's look at here in this website. The combination matches the year of 1909. I absolutely adore this piece from Chester with these regal lion legs. This one is a gorgeous ornate Victorian piece, a salt ball made in 1889, the Victorian era. Let me show you the marks closely. It is made in London. The masters are Edgar Finlay and Hugh Taylor, registered in 1883. The date letter is capital O. Now see the details here, matching the year of 1889. I am pretty much intense into the British silverware market and per my personal observations, the prices for London are cheaper than those in Exeter, Glasgow or York. 
This confetti ball, mastered by Charles Edward Nixon, is from Sheffield. Year of making is 1898. Let me show the marks closely. The crown belongs to Sheffield, Lion Passant is on place, and the date letter is a fancy capital F. Let's look for it in the catalog. Here, the fancy F corresponds to the year of 1898, and Charles Edward Nixon indeed mastered in that period. Quite antique, right? I rightfully love this Birmingham creamer in Art Nouveau style and cabriolet legs made in 1901. See the marks? The anchor mark stands for the town of Birmingham. Now let's look in the catalog. The date letter is a small letter B in the onyx font and it matches to the year of 1901. Okay, let's show one more item, this pool aigoutoir, the drainer pot from Sheffield, made in 1921. I zoom for you the marks, folks. See Sheffield's crown, the passant and the date letter D, a bit fancy D. Look here, the year of making is 1921. Also, note that the masters, Walker and Hall, always used to mark their initials in a pen and cartouche. Therefore, all fits together right. Over the course of this presentation, you may have noticed that I have an accent. You see, in the 70s, there were only three English proficiency schools for the entire country, my former country, and my prospective and prominent parents gave me to the best of this three. I studied English at my age of six years versus other kids that would be introduced to English only from their age of 14 years. The English that I studied was the British Oxford English. Thanks to my foresight parents, in my literature classes I would study Beowulf, Geoffrey Chaucer, William Shakespeare, William Somerset Maugham, William Makepeace Thackeray, George Gardam Byron, Archibald Cronin versus other kids who would study their national authors. Later, with the help of competitive grants or scholarships, I studied in numerous universities in various countries. However, I admit my English is neither British nor American. It's some kind of Cosmo mixture, but I'm not going to change it. I'm in peace with my accent. Finally, we reach the British silver-plated art. I do not possess any silver-plated or electro-plated item to show. My old items were of solid silver. You will read about the invented techniques later in my slides. As far as hallmarks are concerned, in Britain, the electroplated materials are often marked with letters EPNS for nickel or EPBM if the base metal is Britannia. If you recall, I explained that the Russians do not mark the silver plate. They mark M for alloy. Yet, British masters have marks for silver plate as well. Look at the picture to the left. The one that doesn't have the lion percent mark is silver plate. To combat the consumer's confusion or fraud, the crown mark was banned on silver plate in 1890, reserving the right for Sheffield office only, which used it until 1895. Despite the dodgers of pseudo hallmarks would use special letters giving likelihood of solid silver, yet with altered or reverse sequence to avoid charges for fraud. The silver enthusiasts are familiar with the name Rogers, which is from the marketing brand Rogers and International Silver, first used in 1922. Rogers' mark is stamped on solid silver and silver-plated items. It becomes harder to distinguish the originality and year of production of the item by Rogers' sign. The year of making Rogers' pieces in itself is confusing. For example, Rogers Bros silver plate items marked 1847 were not made in that year. 
The year of 1847 corresponds to the jubilee or anniversary mark celebrating Rogers' invention of electroplating onto the base metal flatware. So, it's not about the year of making. 1847 is about the anniversary celebration. Now, once we are done with silver hallmarks, let's get back to the trademark law. Key differences in trademark, patent, copyright, and web domain regulations. Unlike patents, trademarks do not show functionality of a business, goods, or services. A trademark can be acquired with no innovative input whatsoever. Unlike the copyright, trademark refers only to commerce. Both trademarks and copyright may refer to expressive works, however, trademark law does not protect creation, novelty, or inventiveness, that is the patent's territory. The laws and regulations of website names as trademarks are provided below. Next, both patent and trademark laws are federal laws, however, Trademark can go beyond the national borders, obtaining international coverage and protection. Patent law can't, because in my opinion it contains national pride element. Therefore, many prominent scientists and engineers prefer not to patent their inventions for international recognition. Imagine if Wilhelm Röntgen would patent his invention of X-ray in 1895, how expensive one X-ray exam could be, at least in the period before the patent would expire. Instead, Rangen received Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901, which to me is the best of the Nobel outcomes, and his name is celebrated globally to this day. Patent and trademark laws overlap when it comes to the issue of product design. In that case, a design patent may be obtained on the ornamental aspects of the device while invoking the trademark law to protect the design as product identifier. If the design is used to distinguish the particular type of product in marketplace, trademark law may be used to protect the appearance of the product, in this case the surfing board below. How could we address the overlap between the laws? This case, Duster v. 20th Century Fox can be an answer. The 20th Century Fox owned the copyright of a movie based on President Dwight Eisenhower's book Crusade in Europe, published by Doubleday. Duster used the video footage of the related film from a public domain to create a slightly different video of his own and then sold it without giving credit to Fox. The Supreme Court ruled that Duster had taken the materials from public domain, had modified and sold the resulting product. Therefore, there was neither an infringement nor a reverse passing off. Fox claimed that Duster's actions constituted false misrepresentation as to the origin, thus the subject matter was reverse passing off. The court disagreed, explaining that the meaning of the word origin in the statute rests solely on the manufacturer of the good, not to the creator of the work. Because Duster modified and manufactured the movie pieces, it wasn't reverse passing off. The Lanham Act would be sustained if Duster had bought some of the videotapes and repackaged them as its own. This slide explains the difference between the traditional and reverse passing off. Origin is what does matter here. I'm fast forwarding as I have time limit. You will study the slides later if you wish. Next, dilution as a basis of trademark infringement only applies to famous marks. The difference between dilution and infringement is that dilution claim requires showing likelihood that the mark has been or will be tarnished or blurred in some way. Infringement claim requires showing likelihood of confusion as to the source of the product or service, so the bar is higher in infringement claim. 
Also, dilution is not restricted to similar products or services. Trademark infringement lawsuits can only be brought against competitors that provide or produce the same product or service. Now, dilution by tarnishment and by blurring. The key differences. Tarnishment is when trademark is portrayed in a negative light, usually in the context of obscenity, cruelty, lunacy, etc. It also applies when the infringer offers low quality of goods. Tarnishing endangers the trademark's reputation as a wholesome identifier of products or services, while blurring slowly erases away the trademark's distinctiveness Tarnishment attacks the reputation of a mark. An educational case for the trademark blurring is nicknamed as Starbucks versus Charbucks. Starbucks was operating almost 26 years since 1971, when in 1997 Wolf's Coffee started roasting dark coffee trademarked as Charbucks. Both brands of the roasted coffee met high quality standards. Starbucks filed a dilution lawsuit. The district court held in favor of Charbucks, reasoning that Starbucks failed to prove that Charbucks' mark was likely to dilute its famous mark. The Court of Appeals upheld reasoning by the Law Association's doctrine lowering the legal standard for dilution from the actual dilution to likelihood to be diluted. The former actual dilution standard was set up by the U.S. Supreme Court in mostly the Victoria's Secret catalog case. Under the Lanham Act, Section 1052, Disparagement is a statutory cause of action that permits a party to petition to the TTAB to cancel a trademark registration that may disparage or falsely suggest a connection with persons living or dead, institutions, beliefs, or national symbols, or bring them into contempt or disrepute. Unlike the trademark validity claims, disparagement claim can be brought at any time. The US PTO uses a two-step test to determine whether a trademark is disparaging to a group of people. Would the mark be understood in its context as referring to an identifiable group of people? And may that reference be perceived as disparaging to a substantial composite of that group? In a prima facie case of trademark infringement, the plaintiff has to show two things, ownership of a valid mark and likelihood of consumer's confusion. Defense must show at least five of the following eight factors, known as Polaroid factors from the eponymous case Polaroid versus Polaroid. Strengths of the mark, consumer strong association, degree of similarity between the marks, competitive proximity of the products, actual confusion, likelihood that plaintiff will bridge the gap, defendant's good faith, quality of defendant's products, consumer's degree of sophistication. There are four defense strategies in trademark infringement lawsuits. Fair use, first amendment, special defenses to dilution, first sale doctrine. Fair use defense has two subtypes, descriptive fair use and nominative fair use. Descriptive fair use protects the use of trademark as ordinary work to describe or refer to a company or product service by name and applies to fanciful or arbitrary marks. Nominative fair use allows using trademark as name to refer to a product or service. In 1983, the Third Circuit established tests known as lab factors to determine likelihood of consumer's confusion. First, the price of goods and other factors indicative of care and attention expected from the buyers. Next, evidence of the consumer's actual confusion. The third is number of times defendant has used the mark without actual confusion. And lastly, defendant's intent in utilizing the mark. Below are additional and optional factors to consider. 
Now, the key difference between the nominative and descriptive fair use defense is the procedural onset. First Amendment defense includes political speech, commercial speech, and comparative advertising. Here, Bosley case is quite interesting. The angry patient opened the website using the provider's name and under the provider's name to globally ridicule and humiliate the provider. While the ill intent was apparent, the Ninth Circuit decided that defendant could not be held liable for trademark infringement or dilution for using doctor's name in creating a website that criticized the company's business practices and especially where no profit was sought by by defendant. Comparative advertising, which is a type of First Amendment defense, permits a competitor to use trademark owner's mark to make comparative statements. Yet, comparative advertising for dilution defense is often a failure. The first sale doctrine protects the consumers in buying and reselling a product, leasing, bartering, or giving it away without a trademark owner's permission. A person may resell a legitimately purchased trademarked product if the product was not altered. There are limitations though. Sellers must not give the impression like they are authorized by the trademark owner. The seller also may not alter the goods or sell materially different goods under the trademark. If you remember, we discussed that in slide 55, referring to the traditional passing off. Trademark infringement lawsuits are brought in both federal and state levels, and with a few exceptions, marks must be registered and valid. Remedies include injunction, monetary damages, and compensation for the legal fees. Under this section 1117 of the Lanham Act, monetary awards and legal fees are issued only when ill intent is established by the jury plaintiff must show revenue earned by defendant. Defendant must show costs subtracted from the revenue. Here you can study the remedy types and the governing authorities. Unusual or unconventional trademarks include sound, color, voice, smell, texture. They safeguard the consumer by preventing confusion of a product or service with the generic one. The Lanham Act is not concerned about the safety issues. It only covers products, marks, and the source. Taste or sound as safety alerts are governed by the patent law, not trademark law. There is no trademark infringement case if the issue is about product functionality. As ruled in Dipping Dot case, if shape, color, and taste serve as essential ingredients of product, then they are functional. My next two slides are the deeper look to unusual marks and the related common law. In summary, the doctrine of functionality draws lines between trademarks and patents, not between trademarks and copyright, as both trademark and copyright are expressive. This doctrine alone is not a tool for judgment. The tools that the courts use to limit trademark rights associated to unusual marks are secondary meaning, likelihood of consumer's confusion, trademark use, and functionality. The doctrine of functionality is case-specific. The court outcomes are almost unpredictable. This doctrine is also weakened by numerous overlaps. For instance, an acrylic bell has a high quality and nice looks, but it is dysfunctional as a bell. In this case, will the acrylic matter of the bell serve as a trademark versus patent? No, because that look and feel does not link the consumer's mind to the source or utility. Trademark laws are territorial. In cross-border infringement cases, the conduct is subject to treaties and foreign laws. The U.S. federal courts have been reluctant to take jurisdiction over international cases. The Brussels or Lugano Convention, applied in most European cases, 
may impact the enforcement of injunctions or awarding damages in the forum country or in any European state. Section 44 of the Lanham Act implements international treaty obligations for priority of marks arising from international registrations and recording of trademark registrations from outside of the United States. The Second Circuit has set a three-factor test for extraterritorial application of the Lanham Act. First, defendant's conduct has substantial impact on the U.S. commerce. Second, defendant is a U.S. citizen. Third, there is no conflict with trademark rights under the foreign law. Finally, gray market goods or parallel imports are items manufactured abroad and imported to the United States without the consent of the foreign trademark owner. This shall not be confused with the counterfeit situation. Now, exhaustion of trademark rights refers to the level of controlling of the distribution of branded goods. Once a trademark senior holder sells in a particular market a trademarked product, he must allow the resale of that product. Remember, the trademark rights are exhausted by the first sale doctrine. There are two types of exhaustion, national and international. The legal concept of international exhaustion is much more controversial and is recognized in some countries but not in others. A seminal case about gray market exhaustion and remedies is American circuit breaker where the Ninth Circuit ruled that if the two products with the same trademarks are identical and unaltered, gray market goods can enter the United States market. This was pretty much all I had to say about trademarks. And remember, wealth and aristocracy are two separate things. One can be ultra-rich, but have no idea what to buy or what to look for. I hope you found my lecture helpful. See you next time. Goodbye.